Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobre. So Father, we come to you this morning and thank you that we're a family. Thank you for family and that you made the family. And Lord, I just pray for every heart in here. You know where every person is, the sons and the daughters. And I ask that you'd speak to them today. You would encourage their hearts. You'd build them up in your faith. And Lord, we pray for all the churches this morning, everyone that names the name of Jesus in our area, in this beautiful valley. God bless them today. Visit their churches. Save to the uttermost. Heal, restore, mend, and do all that only you can do. We ask that this Mother's Day would be a a particularly precious and lovely and beautiful day for each and every mother and each and every woman that's here and every son. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now down you go. Let's get to the word. The title of this morning's message is Raising God's Heroes. And the most powerful way that you and I can change our world, I believe, is to change the way that we raise our kids. I believe that when we raise our kids God's way, we are changing the world in a way that we could never truly imagine until we get this side of heaven. When Mother Teresa was given the Nobel Peace Prize, and I actually had that little piece of paper that had her her statement on it, it's buried in all this stuff. When Mother Teresa received the Nobel Prize, she was asked, what can we do to promote world peace? She replied, go home and love your family. And I was listening to to a newscast and there was a a singer on there and there's a new song coming out. I I didn't even hear the whole song, but I heard the title of the song and the title of the song was Don't Miss Your Life. And it was a dad singing about his little girls, a busy dad that had missed significant pieces of his kids growing up. Title of the song was Don't Miss Your Life. And I think if I could say something to all of us this morning, it's let's not miss our life. Let's don't miss it. Let's not waste our days in grief and sorrow and regret that we can't change. Because there's nothing you can do about the past. It's written. It's already done. There's nothing we can do about the future because as yet we haven't lived it. But there is something we can do about today. And God says that the just shall live by faith. And we can live by faith and believe God. And we can spend our day as sons and daughters of God, not in any kind of weariness or depression, but in joy and hope and faith, knowing that our king loves us, that our king has given us this day, and that this is the day that the Lord has made. And I shall rejoice and be glad in it. Let's make it a choice today to rejoice in him. And so this morning, as we look at raising kids, there's all kinds of things that can happen. And I want to look at three moms in the word of God this morning, and I want to take some some lessons from their lives. I want to look at at four things about raising my kids in faith, and I'm going to jump off actually from Hebrews chapter 4, because Jim's been in Hebrews for the last year, and it's been an amazing, amazing time, and Luke Our son Luke preached last week on the fear of God out of Hebrews. It was a phenomenal message. And Pastor Dan, of course, is an amazing teacher of the word of God. And they've all been in this book. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 4. And if you'll look with me in verses 2 and 3, it says, For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, being not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. So looking at this book that we've been in for so long and looking at this chapter where God's using the children of Israel as an example. And he's using them as a people that died off in the wilderness. And we see that God took Israel out of Egypt. And Egypt represents Satan's kingdom. And it represents that kingdom of darkness, slavery, the land of not enough, that land of slavery. And he took them out and he brought them into a place, a wilderness place, where they got to know him. And the wilderness was never a place that they were supposed to stay in. The wilderness is the land of just enough. It's where we meet God. It's where God meets our needs and and we begin to see who God really is. But God didn't make us to live in the wilderness. He made us to go through the wilderness and to live in the promised land, the land that is flowing with milk and honey, the land of destiny, the land where God wants his people to live, the land of more than enough, where God can actually flow life to us and through us, where we can stand in our generation and we can be the sons and the daughters of God. And I remember God whispered to me yesterday as I was just coming up here to to speak this message. And he said, remind them that they are raising my royal family. 
that the moms in this house are raising, the dads in this house are raising up the royal family of God. And God has ordained that you and our children and our children's children be on this planet in the 21st century to bring the kingdom of God, to bring the light of the gospel, to bring God's miraculous, incredible, awe-inspiring love and goodness into a world that has no idea what he looks like and who he is. And God says life can come to me or life can come through me. It's all how I'm going to see it and how I'm going to live it. So I want to look today at mixing my life with faith, hearing God's word, and not just hearing it and let it pass through my ears. Right now, and I don't mean to bust you, but I'm going to bust you. Right now, some of you, your minds are already gone. You've left the building. You're here for whatever reason you're here. And your minds are wandering, and you're thinking about what you're going to do today, what you're going to do this week. You're thinking about food. You're thinking about shopping. Some of you girls are already doing something else. Who knows where you're at? And God made us to image like that. We have an amazing spirit that can image. We're made in the image of God, and we can imagine. But you know what? The Israelites, they listened to God's word, and they saw the miracles, but they didn't mix it with faith. They heard it, and it went in one ear and out the other. And that's exactly what can happen today. We can hear this. It can go in one ear, and it can go out the other. And it won't profit you anything. The very thing that God wanted to do in your life, speak into your life, a word that he wanted to say to you, you're going to miss it because you're not going to mix it with faith. I don't want to do that. I don't want to live like that. I've only got so many years left. I want to mix everything I do with the word of God and with faith. I want to hear it and do it. I want to believe it and receive it. I want to see it. I want to see God move in the, in the days that I have left. And so there's some things I can learn. There's some things that women did in this Bible, in this book, that they made the word of God. And God says, I want you to look at their lives because the principles that I'm going to share with you in the next 25 minutes, they're for everything that we do, not just mothering fathering and in the marketplace and in careers, whatever it is you're going to do in ministry, whatever it is, how you're going to live on this earth, these are the principles that are going to change your life and mix it with faith. So let's look at number one. I'm going to give you four things this morning. Number one, if I'm going to raise my kids in faith, if I'm going to raise up God's heroes, if I'm going to hear the word and I'm not going to be like the Hebrews and not mix it with faith, but I'm going to hear it, receive it, and do it, then there's some things that faith is going to do in my life and I'm going to allow it to do in my life. Number one, faith is going to break away from aimless traditions. What does that mean? I was in a, a country called Zimbabwe, not Zimbabwe, I was in Tanzania. I've been in a lot of African countries, but I was there doing a women's conference. And we were with 2,400 Maasai women and Dr. Vanessa was there and Pastor Sue and I were there and we were putting on this women's conference. It was amazing. It was an amazing time. It's a very isolated place. And I remember I was there and we were preaching the gospel and many of these women had been circumcised. Many of these women had been so maltreated and ill-treated that they were weeping as they were hearing the gospel and as they were hearing what God could do. And God brought this verse to my mind and he brought it to me. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you'll go there with me. Actually, Luke was there last week in the fear of God. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17, this is where my son was last week. And if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. He taught on the fear of the Lord, and you need to hear that message. Verse 18, this is where I'm going. Knowing that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your fathers. From aimless conduct, you were redeemed, not with silver and gold. What, were I, what was I redeemed from? From aimless conduct, received by tradition from my fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot, and without wrinkle. What is God saying? When I was there in that nation watching and, and, and ministering and teaching the word and seeing what was going on, God spoke that to me and said, from generation to generation, from tribe to tribe, from culture to culture, you come into this world and you are filled with the traditions of your fathers. You are filled with conduct that is not productive to the kingdom of God. And when you come into the kingdom of God, you've got to realize, child, that there are things you're going to have to break away from. There's things you're not going to be allowed to continue doing. There's things in your life that you've been taught, things that you treasure, things that your family treasures, mindsets and perspectives that are not the God perspective. And if you continue in these things, you will not make destiny. You will not mix your life with faith, and you will not do what I need you to do. So there are things in my life, God says, I have to break break away from 
aimless conduct and the traditions of my fathers. The word is very clear that the sins of the fathers have passed from the fathers to the sons. How does that happen? It's the same vain philosophies. It's the same vain traditions. It's the same aimless conduct. Let me tell you what that word aimless means in the Greek. It means fruitless, empty, futile, unreal, unproductive, lacking substance, devoid of force, success, and worthless. Aimless conduct from the traditions of my fathers is devoid of any success and any kind of force. It is worthless. It is the unregenerate philosophy of the day. Now, we have in our culture mindsets that are changing and setting. And God says, if I as a woman of God, as a mother in the house, if I am raising my children and I continue to allow the aimless conduct of the traditions of my fathers and my culture, my nation, my people, if I continue that, it's going to stop what God wants to do and I've got to break it. And he uses an example and he gives me a, a grandmother and a mother and they're actually Lois and Eunice and he talks about it in 2 Timothy. He talks about women that actually had genuine faith that actually helped Timothy stir himself up for the job that he had to do. And we're going to talk about some aimless conduct in just a minute, but let's go to, let's go to 2 Timothy because I want you to see this. I'm going to have to raise my kids by faith. I'm going to have to stop doing the things that go nowhere. I'm going to have to stop the superstitions and the worthless behavior that maybe I was raised with, the sins and the behaviors that have passed on from generation to generation. And it says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, it says, I want you, Timothy, to call to remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you, the laying on of hands, of Paul's hands, my hands. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. These are last words. Paul's in a Roman prison for the second time, and he's about to lose his head. Timothy is taking the church at Ephesus, which was one of the largest Gentile churches. This is first century Christianity. There is persecution. There is danger everywhere. You walk down Ephesus, you're going to see... The seventh wonder of the ancient world, one of them in the, in the temple of Diana. There are temples everywhere. There's coliseums. People are being wrapped in tar and lit Nero's palaces. There's gladiators. I mean, the culture is completely different than what we see today in the 21st century. First century Christianity. Timothy has much to fear in the natural, and Paul is settling him down. Now, notice there's no mention of Timothy's father in this verse. It's the grandmother and it's the mother. History tells us that Timothy probably had a Greek father because Paul circumcised Timothy. And if he wasn't circumcised, he wasn't Jewish. It means he was probably Greek or Roman. What does that mean? It means that when the husband isn't there or when you're a single mom or when whatever you need isn't going to be right there, there is a genuine faith that you can model and that you can live that will change the destiny of that son or that daughter that you're raising. You don't have to have a husband that comes alongside of you. You don't have to have a family. Maybe you feel like you're all alone in here today and you're thinking, what can I do? How can I change my child? I'm a single mom or I'm a divorced mom or I'm this or I'm that, whatever it is you are. But if Lois and Eunice can be an example to this young man that was going to take the largest Gentile church known in the first century, and Paul is writing from a Roman prison and using these women as an example of modeling faith, breaking away from traditions, breaking away from the things that are going to stop you, then you and I can do it today. When Jim and I got married, we were so screwed up. You know our story. We've told it so many times. And when we came together, we knew that we had to break away from what we knew and we had to learn the kingdom of God and learn what God wanted us to do. We had to break off the old traditions, the way we were raised, the things that we were used to. Now, look, there's some good traditions that you're not to break away from, and I'm not saying that. But anything that is counterproductive to what God's word says is not of the kingdom of God. It's not of the culture of the kingdom. You get rid of it. Now, look, right now in this nation, there's a, there's a massive effort to define marriage. But God's already defined it for me. When a man is going to get married, he says, therefore a man shall leave his mother and his father and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That's God's definition of what marriage in the family is. I can't deviate from that. If you want to marry a man 
or you want to marry a woman, I, you are free to do that. But I can't change the definition of the culture that I am a part of because God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if my culture tells me to jump off of a cliff and everybody else is jumping, I can't go with them. And when you're raising kids, you're going to have to establish new borders and new boundaries and new traditions and new definitions in your family. You're going to have to. When we raised our kids, we weren't the best parents. But there's some things that we were adamant about, and we put borders and boundaries, and we said to our kids, you're not like everybody else. This family is not like everybody else, and we're not going to do things like everybody else. And there's things you're going to like, and there's things you're not going to like, but too bad. We're the parent. You're the child. And God has got over us. We didn't let our kids go to sports events on a church night. They didn't like that. We didn't do Sunday sports. And when Wednesday night came, we had them in the house of God. We had them in children's church and we had them in youth. We had them in church because we knew that it was more important to get the word of God in their hearts than to get something else in their life. Now, look, they rebelled. Some of, I mean, you know our kids' testimony. Some of them took us to hell and back. But God pulled them out of hell. And every one of our children are serving God. Magnificent men and women of God. Magnificent. I listen to them and look at them and think, oh, my gosh, where did they come from? They're better children than we were parents because God is faithful. God is faithful. Not because you do it all right, but because God is faithful and God ordained these children. They are here for signs and wonders. They are here by God's appointment. And if you and I will simply do what God says, he'll take care of the rest. So I'm going to have to break from aimless traditions. I prayed with the kids at night, just like Lois and Eunice. When I was tucking Chloe and we had a sleepover, I had three of the grandkids. And Chloe's, I'm tucking Chloe into bed. She's the one girl out of 11 grandkids. One, one girl. I, mean, I keep saying that because I'm looking at Stacy now because my hope is in you to have, you know, you got one child. He's a little boy, but you know, you're young. We got our whole lives ahead of us here. Maybe we could have a whole bunch of girls. Okay, well, I'll stop. But anyway, I'm tucking Chloe in. She's seven years old and she's telling me a story. She says, Mommy told me that when she was little that, that you and Grandpa took her and Uncle Luke and you wrapped them up in, in blankets and you took them to the church early, early in the morning when they were still sleeping and you prayed. But they got donuts and hot chocolate. <laughs> and we did. Five o'clock in the morning, we ripped those kids out of bed up in Lake Arrowhead and we were praying in the harvest. We look back at it and think, my gosh, what were we doing? Did we ever see the harvest in Lake Arrowhead? No. We didn't. But we see it here. We see it here. We see it here. And I see it in my kids, and I see my kids praying with their kids, and I see the godly traditions now that we have established. You see, you can break generational curses. You can break off those things that want to destroy and have destroyed families and those sins that have passed on. You can break them right now in the name of Jesus just by saying, no more. As for me and my house, we're going to do what God says and start your own traditions of God. Number two, if I'm going to raise my kids in faith, I'm going to have to judge God faithful because there'll be a lot of opportunities to wonder where he is. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. I want to look at Sarah as a mom. Abraham is the father of faith. She is the mother of faith. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11, by faith, Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because, now why did she do this and how did she do this? Here's the answer right here. Because she judged him faithful who had promised. She could conceive seed at a 90 year, years of age because of something. She judged him faithful who had promised. Now what does that mean? What does that mean to judge him faithful? How do I take that little phrase and put it in my life right now? Well, we know what that means. It means that when the... Life hands me stuff. I'm going to have to make a decision, and I'm going to have to add up the facts. I'm going to have to weigh what's going on in my life. I'm going to have to weigh what God has promised, and I'm going to have to weigh what life is handing me. I'm going to have to do that all the time. And I'm going to have to make a judgment. I'm going to have to make a decision. I'm going to have to add up the facts. I'm going to have to weigh the evidence, and I'm going to have to make a decision and make a choice. 
and I'm going to have to do something. She chose. She chose to judge God faithful. She chose to believe God's promise over the circumstances. Now, let's just quickly look at her circumstances. Sarah was 90 when she had Isaac. She was 65 when she left Ur of Chaldees and she went with her husband. And she went and they began to start the dynasty of, of what God had wanted them to do. God called Abraham out and she went with him. She's 10 years behind him. She was a half sister to him. She lived almost 4,000 years ago, so I don't even want to go into that. Just know that it was, that was before the law. It's all right. She had the same father. She had a different mother. And there they go. Off they go by themselves. Abraham was a man of wealth, and off they go. So she wants a child. Every woman wanted a child. That was the worth of a woman is how much she could bear. And you had to have sons because sons carried on the name, carried on the tradition. She couldn't have children. So she's barren. So this woman, I'm talking about judging God faithful when everything else seems to say he's not. So Sarah doesn't have a child. She can't have kids. She's 90 years old and she's gone through menopause. She's past the age of childbearing. She is now an old woman. And now God says to her, you're going to have a child in a year. And she laughs in her tent. And God says, now that you can't have Isaac, you're going to have Isaac. Hello. Hello. So what am I talking about? There are going to be delays and disappointments in our lives. God's going to promise us something, and we're not going to see it. Because month after month, and girls, you know this, because you know about the menstrual cycle that God's put inside of us. If you want to get pregnant, you have that menstrual cycle, you know you're not. And that means disappointment for another month. But then here comes the hope. Well, maybe I'll get pregnant this month. Nope. Well, maybe I'll get pregnant this year. No. Maybe I'll get pregnant this year. No. Maybe this year, no. Maybe this year, no. Maybe this year, no. Until finally it's too late. It's over. Now you can't do it anymore. There's no hope. Are you hearing me? You see, life is going to hand you that when you're believing God. Life is going to look at you and say, and you're going to believe God's promise for something. You're going to say, we can do this, but he doesn't let you do it. Time goes and time goes and time goes. And you look at yourself and you can lose hope in your ability to do anything for God because you can't anymore. How about this one? How about not just delays and disappointments, but how about when people let you down? Because when she finally does get to have a baby, now she's 90 years old. So God's obviously doing something. It says that she receives strength to conceive. That means that they couldn't make love because he's 100, she's 90. Can I just get real in this house? They were impotent. She had a dead womb and he did too. And there was no Viagra. <laughs> Dead. Finished. No sex. That part of their marriage was finished. She received strength to conceive. Something had to come alive in Abraham. Something had to come alive in Sarah. Are you with me? Now let's look at the story. So that God comes to them and says, I am going to give you a child. And it's going to be by Sarah. Because God does not leave the woman out of the covenant. And now they are leaving and they're taking their camp and they are moving and they go to a place where there is a king named Abimelech. Now Sarah, something's happening because she's beautiful. And Abimelech wants her in his harem, 90 years old, so something's happening. Abraham says, tell him you're my half-sister. Tell him you're my sister because I don't want to die. We're supposed to have Isaac. Oh, really? Then let's put you in the bed of a king of another seed and see how Isaac is going to show up. Are you with me? I don't know. I mean, Sarah might have been a little confused at that point. And just she loves her husband. And I'm not here to bash. This is not a bash Abraham sermon. Because I wasn't there and I don't know the circumstances. I just know this. There are times when our loved ones are going to let us down. And not because they want to, but because of life circumstances. They are never going to be able to be the all-sufficient, omnipotent, all-knowing God in our lives. And when Abraham was afraid and Sarah didn't want him to die and she went to King Abimelech's camp and into his bed, this is what happens. She judged him faithful. How does this happen? Through the delays. When people let you down, look what God did. In Genesis chapter 20, he, he comes to Abimelech in a dream. 
in a dream, he shows up at his bedside. God shows up at Abimelech's bedside. I don't know about you, but for me, it would be like, oh, my gosh, change the sheets. Look at this. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said, you indeed, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you have taken, for she's a man's wife. You're a dead man. What's the point? The point is, when men can't, God can, and God's got our backs. When men can't, God can, and God's got our backs. When men can't, God can, and God's got our backs. When men cannot, God can, and God's got our backs. When your families, when you let yourself down, when your families let yourself let you down, when circumstances are delayed, she judged God faithful. She said, you know what? Here's life, and here's the promise. Here's life, here's the promise. Guess what? I'm going for the promise. Even though it's impossible, I'm judging him faithful. When she did that, she received the strength to conceive, and she had Isaac at 90 years old. His, main, his name means laughter, and she said, who would have thought that I would laugh with a son, but God has given me a son. So what's the point in my life? Number one, I'm going to have to break away from aimless traditions and conduct. Number two, I'm going to have to judge God faithful because life's going to hand me a lot of things that are challenging that truth. Number three, and this is going to have to go fast. I've got seven minutes left. Actually, I've got ten minutes left, but I'm not going to take them. I don't know how that works. <laughs> Number three, I am going to, faith refuses to live afraid. Faith refuses as a mom, as a dad, as a saint of God. This all applies whether you're a mom or not. Faith refuses to live afraid. Just like faith judges God faithful because you're going to have opportunities not to. Faith refuses to live bullied by fear. Bullied by it. Satan is a terrorist. He doesn't stop. He doesn't quit. And the example I want to use is a little slave girl named Jochebed, and she was Moses' mom. And in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23, it says, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw that he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. They weren't afraid of the king's command. They weren't afraid of Pharaoh. They weren't afraid of the one that had already issued an edict that says, If you have a male child, he is to be thrown into the Nile and destroyed. They weren't afraid of the fact that they were slaves. They had no value. They had no influence. They had nothing going for them. They were now slaves of Egypt. Their life consisted of making straw bricks out of mud and straw. And now here comes this raging lunatic Pharaoh that says, you're getting so big in your numbers and I'm going to diminish your numbers and we're going to start killing off the male children. So therefore, if you have a male child in your house, he's to be destroyed, he's to be thrown into the Nile River. And it says that she was not afraid of the king's command. Now let's go to Exodus chapter 2 because in this chapter it explains that when she had him, she saw that he was beautiful and this is what happened. So in Exodus chapter 2, look at verse 1 with me. And a man of the house of Levi went and took as his wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and she bore a son. And when she saw that he was beautiful, she hid him three months. This woman looks at this child, and that word beautiful doesn't mean like lovely of countenance, although he's probably a gorgeous child. It means that he was marked by God as unusual. And you know, when she looked at that kid, she said, there's something on this kid. And God told me to tell you, you are raising the royal family. And every child that we have, everyone that we've born, has a mark of God on them. And they are beautiful. And they are fitted for destiny. And God wants us to look at our children. I don't care what they look like to the world. And there's a mark of God and a mark of heaven on them. And they are unusual, beautiful children. Don't be afraid of what the Pharaoh says about them. Don't be afraid of the doctor's reports. Don't be afraid of what your culture says. Don't be afraid of what the school says, of what your neighborhood says, of what things and circumstances are saying. Because if we live afraid, we cannot live in faith. And this little slave girl who had no identity, she had Miriam, her daughter. She had Aaron, her son, and now she has Moses. So Amram and Jacobed, these little slaves that we don't know anything about, had three magnificent children that changed the world. They would never have changed the world if she wasn't ready to stand up to the bully. 
and stand up to hell and say, hell, hell no. You coming near my kids? I'm taking you down. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you do. I don't care what the risk is. I don't care what the report is. I don't care because in the name of Jesus, my God is for me. And if God be for me, who can be against me? And until we stand up as mothers in the house of God and in the house that God has given us to raise up our children and say to hell, no, in the name of Jesus. I'll not be afraid of you. I'll not be afraid of the terror that comes through the evil reports of my day or the plagues that are on this earth or the accidents that can happen as they get their driver's license or who they're going to marry or if they're going to get leukemia or cancer or if they're going to fail. I'll not be afraid of the pharaohs of this world because I believe my children are marked for destiny. And it's going to take every bit of sacrifice and risk you've ever made. Because this is what happens. Faith not only refuses to live afraid, number three. She was a nobody raising a somebody. God takes nobodies to raise up somebodies in the kingdom. Maybe you haven't done much in your life. You look at yourself and think, I'm just a slave. I'll never get out of here. I'll always make bricks and straw. But these kids, these kids are destined for something. These kids have something on their lives. And I'm going to do everything I can in my life to see that they know God and everything that God tells me to do, I'm going to do. If it means I die, I die. But I am going to defy every foul thing that is opposite of what God says for me to do with my children. They may hate you for it for a season of time, but they'll come home. Because the fourth one, not only does faith refuse to live afraid, when you begin to step into this church and you just stop being afraid, you just get up in the morning and say, oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Oh, hell no. Say no to hell. No to Satan. No to darkness. No to what he wants to tell you you're going to have in your life. And I didn't swear for some of you because hell is a real place and hell wants to come into your house every day. Every day. And until you and I get a little grit and a little courage and stand up against fear and say no, we're going to be coward and cowards living in a world never fulfilling the destiny that God has called us to. What if Jacob had not done what she had done? What if she was afraid and Moses had been killed? That woman was something else. I'm going to meet her in heaven. Because this is the next thing she does. Number four, and I got to quit. She lets go and lets God. There comes a time when you're going to have to let go of those kids and let God do what he's going to do. You've done all you can do. You've said all you can say. You've prayed all you can pray. That's as much as you can do. But you let go and you let God because God's got a hold of them. Because here's what she did. When this child is getting too old to hide, it says that when she could no longer hide him in Exodus 2, she got a basket made of papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the banks of the river Nile. And the baby's sister then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen. Listen, I don't know about you, but uh, when you put a baby in a basket in the river Nile where there's crocodiles and currents, and you put the, the hope that you have, and you put it in a basket on that river that was supposed to kill him, and you put him on top of that river of death, and you put him in the basket of faith, and you trust him to God. I don't know if she was crying or not. I don't know what was happening in her heart. But I know there was courage beyond anything I know. I've never put my baby in a basket on a river. I don't care how safe it may seem to be. One crocodile, one current, one brush of wind, anything could happen, and that baby's gone. She put that baby in a basket, and that baby floated on top of death. The hope of Israel, the leader that was going to lead them out of Egypt. Vulnerable, a baby. So easy to kill, so easy to destroy, so easy to snuff out. The only thing that kept that child alive was that mother's courage to not kill him. And that mother's faith to put him in a basket and let him go into God's destiny. And moms, there's a time in our lives when there's nothing else we can do but put him in the basket. And there's rivers of death all around them. But they're in God's basket of faith. 
They're in God's basket of hope. They're in God's basket of deliverance. God gave me a verse so many years ago, Jeremiah 31, 16 and 17. Refrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, says the Lord, for there's hope in your future. Your children shall return from the land of the enemy and they shall come again into their own borders. And as I began to pray that over my children while they were on that river, when they left God and they didn't want to serve God and they were finding God for themselves and finding their own voices, there was nothing more I could do. There was nothing more I could say. But there was the word of God. There was the basket of hope and that basket of faith. And I'm here to tell you this morning that there is no devil in hell and there is no not one loosed on this earth. Hell has no strength against God's mothers that will stand up and will break from their old aimless traditions and conduct. Mothers that will judge God faithful in spite of everything that life has handed them. Mothers that will be absolutely refuse to do life afraid and live in faith and mothers that will let go and let God. There is nothing that will keep our children from the destiny that God has for them. Did you get something out of today? But what I'm going to say now and what I want to say to you now is the most important thing I'm going to say all day. And I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you about something up close and personal and maybe uncomfortable, but it needs to be talked to. It's the elephant in the room and I have to talk about it. And I need to ask you a question. If you were to walk out those doors today, on Mother's Day 2012, May 13th, and for no fault of your own and through no thought in your little head, today was your last day on the planet. Maybe a car accident, heart attack, I don't know, life is fragile, we can't even keep ourselves alive for five minutes, can't even hold our breath that long. Our life is over this day. Would you open your eyes in heaven or would you open them in hell? Now, you might be saying, well, I don't believe in hell. Well, that's convenient, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You might say, I hope I'd open my eyes in heaven. I'm a good person. I think I'm going to heaven. I need to talk to you because you can't hope your way into heaven and you can't believe your way into heaven by the things that you do because God never said, the best hopers are going to heaven. God never said that behavior modification is going to open the doors for us to walk into God's heaven. God said that my goodness is like a filthy rag in comparison to his. And if I'm comparing myself to somebody else, I may think I'm okay. But God didn't say that's the standard of measurement of goodness. He said it's him. And he is perfect. And there's not a human being on this planet, one ever born, that will ever measure up to that goodness. And God knew that we couldn't get to him. So he came to us. God says there's only one way into his heaven. It's not through my behavior. It's not through all the philosophies of men. Because we live in America and we're told that all roads lead to heaven. But God doesn't say that. God says there's only one way to heaven. Only one. He says you must be born again. He told us how to get there. It may not agree with our philosophy, but that doesn't mean a thing because there's a lot of things we didn't believe in. We didn't believe at one time that the world was round. The best of the best thought it was flat. That didn't make it flat. We don't believe and we didn't believe in radio waves and microwaves because we couldn't see them. But we know they're there. There's a lot of things we haven't believed in because we can't see them, but that doesn't mean they're not true. And just because we can't see heaven and we can't see hell does not mean that it's not real. As a matter of fact, hell is so real that God sent his only begotten son so that you and I would not have to go there because he didn't make you for hell. He made hell for Satan and his rebellion. He made you for heaven, but there's only one way there. You must be born again. Now, how do I do that? What does that mean, born again? Well, Jesus explained it very plainly. In John, the third chapter, you can go home and read about it. But Nicodemus came to Jesus. He was a great rabbi in Jerusalem, a celebrity rabbi. Would have been on television if it was today. And he comes to Jesus at night and he says, how do I get to God's heaven? How do I get there? The question I asked you, he asked Jesus. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And he says, what are you talking about? I'm an old man. I can't climb into my mother's womb. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're a teacher of Israel, and you don't understand this. 
What is born of the flesh is flesh. You have a body, it's flesh. You're, you're born of natural parents. But Nicodemus, what is born of the spirit is spirit. He said, look at the wind. You can't see it, but you can see its evidence. He said, you're made in the image of God, Nicodemus. God is a spirit. Lives in a whole different dimension. And Nicodemus, your spirit needs to be born again. No, your flesh is what it is, but your spirit is eternal. It's been severed from God. It has died because of sin. Born into a sin condition. Born into terminal illness in our spirit, all of us. Because our first parents sinned and handed over the dominion of this earth to Satan. God, knowing that we couldn't save ourselves, came to save us. And he slipped out of heaven, emptied himself, came into the womb of a virgin, identified with mankind, and he became a man. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. I'm the only one qualified to carry the sin of the world on me because I am all God and I am all man. Nicodemus, I'm going to be lifted up on that cross. And if you'll look at that cross, Nicodemus, with the eye of faith, and you will surrender your life to me. Let me be Savior and let me be Lord. Lord means boss. Nicodemus, you'll be born again. I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness and I'll bring you back to the Father. It's called redemption and reconciliation. And then he begins the process of restoring us to what we're supposed to be. But none of this happens without that first step of looking at that cross, knowing that Jesus Christ is all God and all man, that he is who he says he is, that he did come. He did climb on that cross. He laid his own life down. He was the only one qualified to carry every sin I've ever committed or ever will commit and every one that you will ever commit. We couldn't be good enough, but he could. He passed every test. He was the Lamb of God. And if I look to that cross and understand he's the only one that can save me, and how do I do that? What is the look of faith that I need to look at? I need to, number one, know it's true. Judge the truth. And number two, surrender my heart and my life to him. This is what that means. He's a gentleman. He's already given salvation to this earth. He's already come, but he's not going to force any of us into it. We have to receive it. Just like if I've got a gift to give you, if you don't receive it, if you don't want it, if you don't take it, I can't give it to you. I may have bought it. I may have wrapped it. It may be everything, the most amazing thing you'll ever have in your life. But if you do not take it from me and receive it, I can't give it to you. It's the same thing with salvation. Until you open your heart and say yes and surrender your heart to him and let him be Savior and Lord, you're not saved. And God forbid if you were to walk out those doors today, you would be in hell and not heaven. And let me tell you, there are more good people in hell than we can imagine. Because it's not your religion. It's not your goodness. It's not your behavior. It's what you've done with your life and your heart. What have you done with Jesus Christ? And until you surrender heart and life to him and say, come in, take over, you're not saved. This isn't some magic prayer and some magic wand. This is humanity looking at that cross, believing, receiving the gift, and inviting him into your life. It's as simple as that. If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm talking to you. If you've been a good person, but you've never surrendered your life to him, gone to church, carried your Bible, been in church a million times, your religion's not going to get you to heaven. It's relationship. The devil believes in Jesus Christ that he's not going to heaven. It's not what you believe in your head. It's what you've done with your heart. If you've been a rascal and you backslid and you served God at one time and you are not serving him, I'm talking to you. All over this auditorium with heads up and eyes open, I'm going to ask if you need to get right with God to raise your hand. God's talking to your hearts in here. You came here today. You heard a message. It's Mother's Day, but you are here for this reason, for this divine purpose, to change your destiny, to let him be Savior and Lord. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm just going to count to three. I'll hit, I'll hit the book like that. Jim's got a much bigger slam than I do. I'm just a little woman. But I'm here to tell you he loves you. He has a destiny for your life. He's not mad at you. But he's done all he can do. You have to receive the gift of life. You have to surrender and invite him in. So I'm going to count to three. Are you ready? If you've been running from him instead of to him, please listen. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. I see that hand. Do I see that other hand? Let me see. Wave them high at me. I count them. 
I see that hand. I see that hand. Help me, ushers, because it's hard for me to see in this auditorium. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. His hand's going up everywhere, and we're out of time, so this is what I want to do. I want us to stand. As we stand and sing this song, if you raise your hand, I want you to walk this aisle. Come down, and, and let's get our life changed. If you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Just come with them quickly, quickly, quickly. Grab your purse, your coat. Grab people. Grab whatever you need, but let's get down here right away. Quickly come. Let's get right with God. Let's get right with God. I give you my soul. Quickly. I'll live Quickly for come. You, You're coming. Alone. Come on. Get out of your seat I and quickly come. Every you got today, you don't have tomorrow. You don't have tomorrow. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. This is the smallest salvations we've ever had in this church. And I don't know what it is. I can't make you come, and I'm out of time, and I've got to close this service. But I'll tell you what, you don't have tomorrow, but you have today. And if you need to get right with God, last, last service, nobody came forward except one man at the end of the service. I don't know what it is, what kind of fear or pride is holding you back, but don't be a fool. We got a letter from a man in prison that came to this church one time. He should have come to the aisle, and he didn't. And the next day, he was in a shootout, and he's in prison for life. But he's saved now, but he's in prison. You've got today. You do not have tomorrow. You do not have tomorrow, and you do not know how serious this is. And I do. I have a glimpse of it. The fear of the Lord is on me. If you need to get right with God, this is not a time to play patty cake with God. This is a time to get your butt down here and get right with God now, today. Today is the day of salvation. And I'm not afraid of your faces. I'm not afraid of what you think of me. Because one day you're going to stand before God. And you're going to have to give an account of what you did with your life. And there's only one way into God's heaven. It's through Jesus Christ. Is there anybody else? Is there anybody else? If there is, you better show me and you better get down here. Because we're going to close this service. I am out of time. All right. If you think I'm yelling at you, I'm not. I sort of am. It's okay. I'll get you saved any way I can if I have to slap you to heaven. <laughs> Hell is so real. It is so real. It is so real. God did not make you for hell. He made you for his heaven. But you cannot go your own way. He is God. And in this church, we fear him. We love him, but we fear him because he alone is God. Oh, I can feel you. I can feel you. I wish I had more time. I'm out. Come back. Don't make this your last time. If you'll follow Pastor Dave, I'm going to let you explain. We're going to give you a private time with God to say yes to Jesus Christ.